All right, so uh, this, in this slide we're going to talk about carbon dioxide transport. So we already talked about how when CO2 and water combine, they make carbonic acid. And then when carbonic acid dissociates, it'll dissociate into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, most of the carbon dioxide in your blood is transported in this regard. So most CO2, when it dissolves in blood, gets immediately converted to carbonic acid, which then immediately dissociates into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. You can see that HCO3+. Plus. Um, and the, the reason why there's uh, you know, an extra oxygen here is from water, if that makes sense. Um, now, that's 70% of, of CO2 is transported as bicarbonate ion, which is actually an interesting because this also functions as a buffer. So it helps uh, to prevent large fluctuations in pH in a tissue. 20% um, of it's bound to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin can transport CO2, but CO2 binds in a different place. It actually binds to a different spot on hemoglobin. And 7% um, to 10% of that is also dissolved directly in blood plasma. So some of that gas can just dissolve straight into plasma and not be converted to, to carbonic acid, just dissolve into plasma. Okay? But you see the majority of it is uh, transported as a molecule by carbonate. <clears throat> and this is an important equation to understand because we know that if we add more CO2, it's going to force the reaction in this direction, which means you're going to make tissues more acidic, right? Or if you start removing CO2 from your body, it's going to draw the reaction in this direction, which will make your blood or body tissues less acidic because you're actually removing hydrogen ion in that regard. Um, it's called Le Chatelier's principle. You guys will learn about, more about that in, in general chemistry. But if you add more reactants to one side of the equation, it's going to drive it in the opposite, so the products here. Or if you remove this reactant, it'll, you know, drive it in this direction. Uh, yeah, this, because this is hydrogen ion, which is basically an acidic proton. And the, the way you get this formed is that when CO2 and water combine, they make carbonic acid, which dissociates into hydrogen ion. But if you start removing CO2 from your body, like exhaling it, then you're going to start to drive the reaction in this direction, which is actually removing hydrogen ion. And it makes it more basic. You got it. Or less acidic. So um, now carbon dioxide does play a role on ventilation rate. And so someone asked actually this question earlier. Like if CO2 levels were high, how does that influence the rate of ventilation? Well... Slow, uh, slow, shallow breathing will actually increase carbon dioxide levels in blood, right? Like, let's say if you just started breathing really slowly and shallow, are you able to remove CO2 from your body as well? No. No, exactly. So CO2 levels will start to rise in your bloodstream, <laughs> which will lower your pH or basically make it less basic or more acidic, right? If you have rapid, deep breathing, like with hyperventilation, then you're expelling a lot of carbon dioxide from blood, if you start to remove CO2 from your bloodstream, then you see that the blood becomes more basic or less acidic, which is a rise in pH, right? A higher number means it's more basic because you're removing CO2. So what this means then is that ventilation rate is something you can use to change your body's pH. Now, later on, we'll talk about the renal system and how your kidneys can regulate blood pH as well. But the short-term mechanisms of blood pH regulation relate to the lungs, now, if you start breathing really deeply and heavily and rapidly, you're going to expel a lot of carbon dioxide, which is essentially removing acid from your blood, right? So you can see that the blood becomes more basic. It's more of a rise in pH. Or if you stop breathing and you're not expelling carbon dioxide from your lungs, CO2 will start to rise in your bloodstream and it makes your blood more acidic. Now, um, this is basically the, one of the determinants of ventilation rate. So if you're breathing slowly, chances are you're just going to breathe slow enough to match your body's metabolic needs. If you're breathing heavily, that suggests that CO2 levels are increasing in your bloodstream and you need to expel an excess amount of CO2 to meet that, that you know, particular homeostatic variable. Now, uh, changes in ventilation then can adjust your pH. So what if all of a sudden you just held your breath for a minute? What's going to happen to your blood pH? It's going to decrease. Your blood pH is going to decrease. It'll lower. And it's going to lower because you have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide in blood, which is making more acid. carbonic acid. And then that can dissociate into acid protons, right? And, um, you know, there's normal ranges of blood pH. And if you get outside that normal range, then, you know, death can occur. That makes sense. Um, like if you get a pH lower than 6.8 of your blood, uh, that's near the fatal levels, which isn't that much different. Think about it. Like your normal blood pH is 
or so, 7.35 to 7.45. A blood pH of 6.8 is nearing fatal levels, so it's getting too acidic. Um, but what helps prevent rapid changes in pH also is the fact that you have bicarbonate buffer. Exactly. And that also is a, is a byproduct of this whole carbonic acid system, so it's kind of cool. Now, your kidneys can also help eliminate excess acids, but we'll come back to that later. Now, what's also interesting to you guys is that your lungs are only 20% perfused at any moment in time. Remember, perfusion meant that there was a certain degree of blood flow in a tissue, right? So if your lungs are only 20% perfused, that means that only 20% of your lungs have blood flow at any moment in time. You might wonder, why is that? Well, you have a lot more blood vessels in your lungs than you do blood being ejected from your heart. So what this means then is that with a limited amount of blood being ejected from your heart, you have to send that to the parts of your lungs that are going to give you the highest return on investment, right? You got only 20% of your lung tissue is going to be perfused. You want to send that blood to the best areas of the lung that will give you the most maximal effects if you can only perfuse 20% of your lung tissue at any moment, okay? So the way this works is through a process called perfusion ventilation coupling or ventilation perfusion coupling. So perfusion refers to blood flow. Ventilation refers to airflow, and you want these to be matched. Like, what if an alveolus had poor airflow? Would you want to send a lot of blood to that alveolus? No. no. It would be inefficient, right? If it's not getting good airflow, then you're not going to get good gas exchange. So that wouldn't make sense. What about if an alveolus is very well ventilated? You get a lot of airflow in that alveolus. You want to send the blood to that. Yeah, then you want to send blood to that particular alveolus. And that, then you're going to get the highest return on your investment, so you can eliminate as much CO2 as possible and absorb as much O2 as possible. So this is one of the reasons, um, this is actually one of the ways that your lungs are able to uh, regulate uh, basically, uh, you know, blood flow to well-ventilated areas. It's actually pretty cool. So what this means is that, let's say if uh, an area of your lung were plugged with mucus and it's not getting good airflow, then your lungs start sending less blood to that part of your lung. That's kind of cool. Yeah, so it's actually a way to, um, you know, make it more efficient gas exchange. So... Uh, the reason why it's never really fully balanced is that we have regional variations due to gravity and airflow. And some alveolar duct can be plugged with mucus. Uh, but we can alter these uh, ratios to give us the highest return on investment. And some of the best ratios would be like 0.7, right? So 0.7 would be like uh, a ratio of perfusion to airflow would be about 70%, which would be the, one of the best. You'll never get 100% perfusion and airflow. Um, just doesn't happen. But 70% is nearing you know, what you want to achieve. So what this is showing here, you guys, is the, um, let's give an example of like an alveolus that's getting poor airflow, right? So that it's getting a lot of blood flow, but its airflow is low. So that although it's well perfused, it's not well ventilated, maybe because this alveolus is plugged. If the alveolus is plugged, what's going to happen to CO2 levels in the air in that alveolus? They will be high, right? How about O2 levels? They'll be low in the alveolus. And uh, what's cool, you guys, is that High CO2 levels and low O2 levels in the alveolus, that actually stimulates vasoconstriction. If you vasoconstrict, then what we find then is that you get less blood flow in the capillaries that serve that alveolus, and it makes sense. If your CO2 levels are too high and your O2 levels are low, that suggests that the alveolus is getting poor airflow. You don't want to send blood there. So what about if you have a really well-ventilated alveolus? You guys see how it's nice, nice, big, and plump, right? It's getting a lot of airflow. Um, that's going to give, that means you're going to have low CO2 levels in the air of this alveolus, high O2 levels in the air of the alveolus, which then, due to chemoreceptors, stimulates vasodilation of these blood vessels. And when you vasodilate, that's going to increase blood flow. That way you can get good gas exchange between blood and air in this alveolus. But only 20% of your alveoli are perfused at any moment in time. So which alveoli are going to get the best airflow? Or, I'm sorry, blood flow the one with the best airflow or ventilation, right? And which ones aren't going to get as much air, uh, blood flow? With less airflow. You got it. And so that's what we call it ventilation perfusion coupling because you want airflow and blood flow to be pretty well matched. If there's a mismatch of airflow or blood flow, then that leads to inefficiencies, right? What if an alveolus had really good ventilation but poor perfusion? Now you're just wasting air, right? Because you're not getting good gas, good gas exchange. Air is there but you're not able to have exchange of gases with blood, right? Or what if you had a very well-ventilated, I'm sorry, a very well-perfused alveolus, 
that have poor airflow. That's also inefficient because now you're sending blood, a limited amount of blood, to an alveolus that doesn't give you any return on that investment or blood flow, right? Because now you're not, still not getting air uh, gas exchange. So it's pretty cool how these things are coupled. Um, and uh, that's one of the ways your lungs can be very efficient. Now, uh, earlier we talked about how your pulmonary system is in, is in, uh, it's innervated by the autonomic nervous system. And that includes your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Remember, sympathetic is fight, flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. Well, the sympathetic nervous system stimulates bronchodilation. If you bronchodilate, then you're basically relaxing the smooth muscle of your bronchioles, bronchi, which is increasing the diameter of those airways, which reduces the resistance and increases airflow. Opposite to that, during the parasympathetic response, or rest and digest, this actually stimulates bronchoconstriction. And so that <clears throat> airways don't need to be as wide open, right? Uh, you don't need as much airflow if you're resting and digesting. So if you bronchoconstrict, then you're decreasing airway diameter, which increases resistance and decreases airflow. And the purpose of this is a kind of energy conservation, right? If you're resting and digesting, you don't need a lot of airflow, which means by constricting those, those airways, then you, know, you, uh, you don't have to work as hard to get air, um, less air to move in, in and out of your lungs. Now, uh, the way this is controlled, you guys, is by respiratory centers of your brain, uh, specifically the brain stem. Remember, the brain stem included your midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata, right? So the pons and medulla oblongata have the respiratory centers. So the ventral respiratory group controls inhalation and exhalation through the phrenic nerve. And what does the phrenic nerve innervate or connect to? Remember from AP? pH, phrenic connects to the... Respiratory diaphragm, okay. <laughs> the respiratory diaphragm. Yep, C3, C4, C5, staying alive, right? So it comes from cervical plexus. It innervates the respiratory diaphragm. We have the dorsal respiratory group that receives information from your body and it relays input to the VRG so that respiratory centers receive input from peripheral receptors that can also influence um, you know, your output to ventilation muscles. So what this slide shows then, you guys, are the different factors that can influence um, your respiratory rate. So in green, we're showing that these are the afferent sources of information. In red is the efferent sources of information. So red's output, green's input. So let's look, at, let's look at all the inputs here. So what are the inputs to your brainstem to change your ventilation rate? Well, for one, chemical content of blood. That makes sense, right? If your blood were very acidic, which is sensed by chemoreceptors in the blood vessels, would you want to increase or decrease your ventilation rate? If your blood were acidic, increase. increase it, right? Because if your blood's acidic, then you want to expel more carbon dioxide, right? And so we actually have chemoreceptors in our aorta and carotid bodies, as well as uh, ones that you find associated with cerebral spinal fluid or CSF. And this actually sends information to your brainstem <coughs> about ventilation rate. So what if your blood pH was very basic or not so acidic? Yeah, then you might want to slow down. They call it apnea. So what's interesting, guys, is that people get like sleep apnea or just apnea in general. Sometimes the best mechanism to adjust pH is just to stop breathing. What if your blood's pH was so basic and you want to get back down to a more normal level, right? No, it's too basic. You just stop breathing. You stop breathing, CO2 levels start to build up in your bloodstream, which can bring you back to homeostasis. Once you get to homeostasis, then you start to breathe again. So people with sleep apnea, not always, but sometimes it's just a normal mechanism to get their blood pH back to normal. I know. I know. Just so the, your body's solution is just stop breathing for you know maybe 10 seconds. And that could, that could acidify your blood back to homeostasis level. It's kind of cool. Um, and these, these chemoreceptors you find in the carotid bodies, right, right where your external and internal carotid arteries split, as well as your aorta and CSF near your hypothalamus. Now, um, other inputs, you guys, for muscles and joints. If you were using muscles and joints more so, <coughs> then that would make sense to stimulate a higher respiratory rate, right? Like if you're contracting muscles and moving your joints more frequently, it would make sense to stimulate your ventilation rate. Increase. That's what this is showing here, you guys. So stretch receptors and muscles and joints actually stimulate you to breathe more quickly. Okay. How about ear tint receptors in your lungs and your airway? 
if your if your lungs are being irritated, do you guys think you want to breathe more heavily or, or less heavily? Less, less. Yeah, less. Now it almost seems counterintuitive because you might almost assume that if there were if there were irritant molecules in your lungs, how that might might you might start breathing more heavily to expel those. But the assumption then is that by breathing more heavily, you're not inhaling more, right? So that uh, what we see here then is that irritant receptors actually will prevent you from inhaling any further. And actually, they initiate a cough reflex or a sneezing reflex. Okay? There's also another type of reflex, you guys. I don't know if the name's up here. It's called a herring brewer reflex. And it's actually stretch receptors in your lungs. So when you inhale, what keeps you from inhaling any further? Why, why can't you just keep going forever? You don't want your lungs to rip, right? So what's cool, you guys, is there are baroreceptors in your lungs that can sense pressure or stretch. And when they're overstretched, it inhibits you from further inhaling. So it prevents overfilling of your lungs and therefore protects your lung tissue from overinflation. We call it the herring brew reflex, and it's uh, mediated by, by baroreceptors in the lungs. So that's actually pretty cool. Um, what other input would you have? That's about it. Um, output, you guys, would be to ventilation muscles, you know, like intercostal muscles or your respiratory diaphragm. So what nerve innervates the respiratory diaphragm? The phrenic, right, with the pH, phrenic. And then there's other nerves that connect to intercostal muscles as well, that you, that other muscles in your body too that are involved with, with ventilation. Now, uh, just to wrap up this, this, this chapter, you guys, um, just going to finish here with ideas like smoking, emphysema, and lung cancer. Um, what we're seeing here is, is uh, lungs that are more healthy, and this, these are lungs that are uh, filled with more like, uh, you know, anthracosis, which is basically just carbonaceous material. And so just looking at the difference between the two, like healthy looking lungs are kind of more pink. You got a moderate amount of uh, anthracosis or carbonaceous material that builds up in the lungs over the course of a lifetime. But if you're exposed to a lot of carbonaceous material like smoke or smog or a lot of dust, you know, then that can start to build up in your lung tissue. Although our lungs have a natural tendency to remove that debris, right? So what were some anatomical features of the lungs to help remove inhaled particles? Yeah, the cilia. Yeah, cilia, right? So the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium can help remove some of that debris. However, you can overload that function. Or macrophages can also help remove debris, but you can also overload your macrophages. So, you know, it depends on how much you're exposed to. But you can see that even in the lung tissue here, that it starts to not only get removed from the airway, but it gets absorbed by your lung tissue and it stays in your lung tissue. Now, the reason why this puts you to high risk for cancer is that this is irritating. And earlier we learned about that epithelial tissues that are chronically irritated can have metaplasia, where they turn from one epithelium to another. And then from metaplasia, you can get hyperplasia and then dysplasia, which is disordered growth. So a chronically irritated epithelium can become can cancerous. And this can be not only exposure to just like cigarette smoke, but other irritating chemicals, right? Or just you know, other, other irritants of the epithelium. Things you're allergic to, uh, molecules you might be exposed to like in a workplace setting. And, um, you know, this can actually put you at a high risk for lung cancer. Now, uh, what this is showing you guys is like smokers lung up close. So you can see that this is anthracosis, which is basically just sort of like a, a, a tattooing of the lungs. Because the lung tissue actually gets um, embedded with these pigmented molecules. The immune system tries to remove this, but many of these molecules are difficult to digest. And it ends up tattooing the lungs and kind of staying there long term. So even if you haven't smoked in like you know 20 years, uh, the material is there and the damage can catch up to you later. So there's individuals that maybe quit smoking three decades prior, but they still get, end up getting emphysema later in life. Because the, the kind of the damage catches up with them. So... Um, although there are some uh, short-term benefits you can see from uh, uh, stopping smoking, like in, in the order of minutes. Like if someone hasn't smoked a cigarette in minutes, you can already see changes in their blood flow in hours, days, years. There's actually nice, progressive, good changes that can occur over the course of you know stopping smoking for some time. But um, sometimes, sometimes the damage is, is irreversible as well.